those two should be open. Should be open. Oh, 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 oh. This doesn't seem fair, does it? No. <laughs> you better do a lot of talking about it. It's fine, they may not be too worried about it. Bueno, buenos días, compañeros. Antes que nada, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, sorry for about the slight delay for the beginning of the press conference. As you know, we're going to commence the press conference of the film, which is closing the official section this year in this festival, which is the film Dance First. And to present the film, as you can see, we have a lot of the cast and crew. And to go, uh, I'm, let me introduce everyone who's here today. On the other end, we've got Tom Thostrup, producer of the film, Michael Livingston, producer, Neil Forsyth, screenwriter, Fiona Shi, actor, Gabriel Byrne, actor, James Marsh, the director of the film, Sandrine Bonner, actress, Aidan Gillen, actor, and Tilu Shagilani, executive producer. Let's open up the press conference straight away. I hope you can all hear me. Congratulations for the film. I would like to ask the director, how did this project uh, get into your hands and why did you decide to make a film in a documentary sort of way? And Mr. Byrne, um, in the script, how, what were your main sources of inspiration to prepare such a complex uh, character? Uh, that was of it. Yes. Um, no, no, no. The, it, it, can you hear me? Yes, yes it is. Channel 3, volume. No, 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 no. Hang on. Okay. Okay. Yes. The, 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 question, the, the, the question, I'm not sure she's going to repeat it, but I recall it very well. Um, due, due to the, ha, ha, she's going to repeat it. There was a problem with the Smilch Danish translation because we hadn't explained how it worked. Okay, just a question. Channel 3, it's on Channel 3. Okay, I hope everyone can hear me now. Well, okay, could you please repeat the question? I think that would be the best way because they didn't have their headphones on and they couldn't listen to the translation. I would like to ask you, how did the projects come, to, come into your hand and why did you ch ch decide to make a film in a doc do like a documentary, which is one of your speciality? And to Gabriel, for example, apart from the script, what were your main sources of inspiration in order to portray such a complex character in the film? Thank you. Well, I'll go first. Um, the script was written by Neil Forsyth, um, who's there. And, and it came to me during the pandemic, which was an interesting time for a school like this to come to you. Um, and Neil had worked already on a, a television uh, film about Samuel Beckett. And I expected it to be a sort of conventional biography of Samuel Beckett. And so I read the first page or two and it felt like it was gonna be a conventional biopic of Samuel Beckett. So you start in the Nobel Prize. It all felt very sort of predictable but within a, a couple of pages, lots of other things had happened that got me very interested in the, in the script. Uh, it doesn't, it becomes very subversive early on. I think the other part of your question was, I think if I understood it correctly, was why I didn't make a documentary film when I've made lots of documentary films. Well, this was a great liberation in a way, doing a kind of speculative biography of Samuel Beckett, when you're speculating and using short, vignettes of his life. Felt like a really good way of, of making a playful film about Samuel Beckett as well as a film that had some ideas in it. So Neil's writing persuaded me to do it as a feature film, not a documentary. And um, <clears throat> I, think I, I, I think I understand the second, um, the second question. Um, I think that Beckett as a, as a as a character is a, um, sometimes portrayed as a, a, and he portrayed himself as a kind of a mythical uh, figure, um, oftentimes dissociated from real emotion, which I think comes from the perception of his, of his work. 
But if you look at any of those plays, uh, underneath the bleakness and the despair, um, there's tremendous, huma tremendous humanity. And I think that Neil's script was um, really good in terms of presenting uh, the life of a man who is a myth in a, in a human way with a kind of a surreal touch. Because um, Beckett approached the world in his work in a surreal way. And I think it would have been a mistake to have done a conventional born here, did this, did that, died there kind of predictable um, um, biography. So um, from that point of view, I think it's an original take on what could have been an extremely difficult fictional film to make. Hi, good morning. I'd like to ask about the aesthetic decision of the black and white in the film and colour. How did you decide, why did you decide to do that? And also to Gabriel, um, the issue of having, two, having to portray two characters on the screen. How was it to work <laughs> looking at yourself? How did all that go and how, how was that done? Thank you. Yes, Gabriel. How did you how did you how did you go go about the facing yourself in the character? Why we chose to film the film predominantly in black and white? Um, well, there were sort of several obvious reasons why. Um, I began to look at photographs of Beckett's situation in the 1930s and 40s in Paris, and went to a photographer called Brushai, who's a Hungarian photographer who worked in France and in Paris in particular, and sort of fell in love with the way he depicted Paris um, at that time and felt uh, that this would really work well for the film. It, and also Beckett, the received imagery of Beckett is a kind of monochrome Beckett, you know, with a cigarette and, and a profile. Um, to be honest, it also it was helpful that we shot the film in Budapest and were then able, with black and white, to kind of evoke the period in a certain kind of way. Um, so I think it was the right choice. And then towards the end of the story, it felt like you caught up with uh, sort of film time and you were in a sort of contemporary world and the film then, you know, changes to, to color. Um, so I hope that works for the, for the audience, but it was a, a fairly sort of easy choice for me to make as a filmmaker. There was a, there was a second question for Mr. Byrne uh, as regards to portraying two characters, that is to say. How did you address that? I'm not too sure whether he's got... Yes, how do... Yes, you were doing yourself. Yes, that's right. Yes, that's right. Um, technically, it was difficult because usually when you're doing drama, you're talking to somebody else. But when you're talking to yourself, which I do myself in, <laughs> in, in life anyway, um, that could be technically challenging, but between James and uh, the rest of the crew, uh, they made it they made it really um, really easy technically. But you still can't get past the fact that you are in the end talking to yourself. But sometimes talking to yourself can be the best conversation. <laughs> Yes, there are other questions here. Okay. Hi. Uh, He's speaking in English. Questions on the film. I had uh, two questions. One for the director. The first one is about uh, this place where the character of Samuel Beckett goes to talk to himself. Seems like a very idyllic sort of. Place. What, what was the inspiration to create the, that space? Because it was really, really interesting. And also for Aidan Gillen, I, I wanted to ask because I've tried to read the Ulysses book and I think that uh, your character is very fascinating in real life. How was the process of getting to, to impersonate him in this movie? Thanks. Who's, who's going first? I guess I should, I should go first. Um, so, remind me of the question, if you could. 
that, that I it was the English that threw me. Not ah, so, sorry. Uh, that <laughs> idyllical right. place where uh, the character Samuel Beckett is talking to himself. That that space. What was the inspiration to create that? Well, I, I can also ask Neil, uh, the writer, to weigh in because I, I got a script that said a wasteland, um, and I think one of the things I thought about was in French. Beckett talked about lieu vague, which is sort of vague places. In, in Waiting for Godot, for example. So I, I began to think, well, how do I get a place that's somewhere and nowhere at the same time? So I asked my location manager, researcher, to, to find any unusual places in Budapest that we could consider. And he then had quite a few options and came up with this abandoned quarry that felt very, when we went there, I thought, this feels, it feels right. Um, but the idea behind it I think Neil could, could, could answer and speak to. Yeah, I mean, I think in terms of giving help to a set designer, a wasteland is probably about as hopeless as it gets in terms of... Yes, it was, actually. Yeah, telling them <laughs> what, what to then do with it. But <clears throat> I think, theoretically, Beckett was never funnier or angrier or more scabrious than when he was talking to himself, you know, whether it was his diaries or short stories or his thinly veiled autobiographical writings. So it was trying to create a device where we could see Beckett turn on himself, question himself, uh, berate himself, and, and poke fun at himself, I suppose. So it was, um, that was the kind of theoretical take. And then I suppose I just handed the creative reality of that over to, to James and his team. And I think they did a, a brilliant job in it. And I think Gabriel's performance was very very clever and measured in that and finding the points of difference between the two the two characters if you like so um, I thought that was brilliantly achieved in the film um, and to answer the part of the question directed to me um, yeah I, I suppose it can seem like a daunting task sometimes to play real life characters particularly ones who are so iconic and uh, literary genius um, I had done it a few times myself before, played re real people, and I find it quite um, interesting. You know, a lot, of your, a lot of your work is there for you. A, a, lot of, a, a lot of your choices are kind of, they've already been made. I wouldn't say it's an impersonation. I don't think Gabriel was too, you know, obsessed about it being a direct impersonation either, because at the end of the day, you know, you're, you look like, I look like this, you know? Um, it's, and as James said, it's not a full, you know, uh, birth to death biopic or whatever, you know, it's chapters of, of uh, Beckett's life and one of those chapters, which is a very interesting one, is when he went to um, work with Joyce. Um, and for me, I guess it was just about trying to get across what that spark might have been, what the influence was. And in a way, you know, I think what Beckett learned from Joyce was to just do it himself you know, and to do it his way, which they both did, and both changed the landscape of literature. Um, so, you know, it's an honor to get to do it, um, and I hope it works. <laughs> Another question here, please. Because it's going to be hard for you to see me otherwise. Um, for the actors who age through the movie, I would like to know how, how does aging, the aging of your character, affects the way you act? Because I assume you have to change completely what you're doing, your mannerisms, and the way you move and speak, depending on the age of the character in the moment, so it's believable. We also had two actors playing some of the characters. So Fionn starts as the young Beckett, and Gabriel inherits. This is middle age Beckett. Yeah, like I, I think it affects him too because you are also different ages along throughout the movie. So I guess like your younger version must act and move differently to your older version. And same for you two guys. Like the ages do change throughout the movie. Yeah. Oh yes, I mean. I Sorry, think I feel that, I'm not that, explaining that's, myself. No, you, is no, this, <laughs> does this make sense? A perfectly clear question. I, maybe I'm not the best person to answer it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think. Um, I, I think that. Something that Gabriel and I tried to establish very early was um, what mannerisms would be unique to my version of Beckett and, and his, and then uh, what would carry out throughout both. Um, I think probably the most difficult was the youngest version, the kind of teenage going into early 
20s. Um, but there was also a lot of freedom in that because uh, you change so much in that time. I, I certainly hope I'm not like I am or like I was uh, when I was um, that age. But uh, in terms of the process of doing that, I put together a board of any image I could find of Beckett and kind of categorized it into when he's talking, when he's smoking, when he's walking and things like that. And then we went through that together uh, to kind of establish what would be appropriate for the different uh, versions. No sé si hay alguna otra pregunta. Are there any further questions? Well, while further questions come along, I would like to ask a question. There's something that I think is very interesting in the film. What's very interesting in the film is the story of Samuel Beckett. And I think there's exceptional writing of the female uh, characters as well, uh, which complete the whole, the, the main character, because we can see many of the things of the processes that Beckett goes through as an author, as well as a person, through the reaction of the women who surround him in, in the film. So I would like you to talk about this as well, the director of the film, as well as the screenplay writer, and especially I would like Sandrine Bonner to explain a little about the conception of her character, which surprised me very much because of her complexity and nuances, and above all because of that capacity of moving people through the contradictions of the character. So therefore, I'd like you to talk about these female characters, which I think are maybe eclipse because of the strong, uh, because of the strength of the main character, but they're very well written and very well portrayed, by the way. I would say that's one of the reasons I wanted to make the film. Mm. There were strong female characters that were shaping his destiny. It wasn't the great man and his women. It was mm. the women shaping the man. Um, I think Sandrine's character was, in life, was a very cru crucial part of Beckett's mm -hmm. life, working life, career. Um, but again, to, to reiterate, one of the reasons I liked the script so much was because there were strong female characters right from the get-go with his mother. Um, but Neil, of course, was the person who put those together, so he can talk a bit more about that. And Sandrine must also talk about it. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think he is such a such a clear view on the world, Beckett, and um, depending on your subjective point of view, it was either militantly bleak or highly accurate, you know, and I think that he, you try and work out where that feeling and conviction of what life is comes from, you look at the key relationships within the person's life, and clearly, um, between Barbara and Suzanne, that's where it came from. I spoke to his biographer who said that um, very late on in Beckett's life, Long after Suzanne's death, he spoke to him, I think when Beckett was in the nursing home, and he brought up Suzanne's name, and Beckett said, the guilt, the guilt. And you know, and you hear, when you hear something like that, it distills the whole relationship and situation for you, I think, as a, as a writer. So um, it was clearly formative in his, I think, particularly his conclusion of what life is um, in his later years. And so it was key to make that a key point of the structure of the film, and I think it was just beautifully performed. So, Sandrine, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the character. Um, yes, Suzanne is very important uh, for Beckett because um, she supported him for her whole life. And um, he was cruel with her because he had a, a double life. And um, it was very interesting to to play that, that uh, this woman is, uh, uh, she's, uh, she's get, getting tired and tired by the time because he's, uh, she loves him. And, uh, but she was always there for him uh, until uh, the end, until her death. And um, it's a nice character because she has a lot of uh, dignity and it was uh, very interesting to, to play that and, uh, and to share uh, this love with uh, this, uh, <laughs> this Beckett. <laughs> uh, yes, it was interesting. And it was also interesting to, to, to act the age until the, the, the end and the illness also. And, uh, and it was wonderful to, to work with, with uh, James. 
he's very subtle, very uh, very attentive with uh, the actors, and uh, we took uh, he takes time with the actors, and uh, which is great. I'm proud to have done this movie. I haven't seen it yet, <laughs> but yes, for I now I could soon. say I'm proud. <laughs> Maybe tomorrow I won't say that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. I'm sure it's a very good movie. Yes, there's another question here. Hi. Hi. The casting process for Samuel Beckett and and the young and the old version, because they almost physically look at each other. I'm looking at them now, and I would say, I would say they were father and son. So, how did you find? How did you find, especially? Uh, Fionn, or who did you think of first? J uh, was it Gabriel or Fionn? How did all that go, the casting process? Could you so talk about that, please? Of course. Um, it was a real pleasure to cast the film. When I read the script, I immediately thought of Gabriel, and that's just how it was. So I thought, well, if he can do it, then the film can work. If he can't do it, then maybe I won't do the film. So um, Gabriel and I had a series of, of kind of conversations about it that were, you know, exploratory and also quite serious about what we were doing and why we were doing it. Um, and then you think, well, you know, obviously there's a, there's a different iteration of the character, a younger version. Uh, and Fionn I'd, I'd seen in um, a TV show called Normal People, and he plays a, a quite a memorable character in that TV show. And, uh, and I thought, well, this, this is great, and he's great. And the other thing is, he looks just like Samuel Beckett um, in, a, in a way that was really helpful, I think, for the film's verisimilitude early on. That the young Beckett was, is sort of, you know, you, you fix that very well with Theon's, not just his appearance, but also his performance. And to connect the two, that was the actor's private dialogue as much as my, um, I encouraged it, but that was their... That's what good actors do. They they want to you know talk and 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 share ideas. So to be honest, the two best actors for the roles were the were the ones I got. You know, and that's you can't do much better than that. And then I was able to build an ensemble cast um, with Sandrine and Aidan, who I'd worked with before, and uh, Gronia and Leonie there um, to build this really. I think very collaborative ensemble. It was a, a kind of really a nice film to, to work on. All films are kind of difficult in certain ways, but the collaboration with the actors and the kind of way they work with each other w was really special on this one. And I was, I mean, my casting was was vindicated by the fact that I think everyone was great in the film. Vamos aquí con una última pregunta. There's one final question here. The truth is, the film is a, a gift for the. The film is a gift for the spectator. It's a magnificent film, a vish, a efficient and suggestive, with a beautiful script which drives it. The women's char women characters, everything, and what I would like to know is whether what happens in the film about that vengeance or revenge that James could be revenge wouldn't be the reverse of that blame or guilt. That is to say, whether that guilt as the driving force behind the film, he says, well, it's revenge of Joyce, but that doesn't make much sense at the end of the day because not getting married to the daughter and she being taken to a lunatic asylum and so on and so forth. How did that work? Or how was that driven? You, you catch what I'm saying? Because guilt is what's driving, was driving, the, was driving the plot. But don't you think that uh, that, that guilt may be... How did, you t how did you do that take on, 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 on uh, Beckett's guilt? Shame in English is more accurate than guilt, and I think shame is a very interesting emotion, um, and obviously it haunts Beckett. And the, the, st the story of the film is a kind of review of his life through the mistakes he made as he would see them, and the relationships he that he conducted that didn't go well. Um, I think with in Joyce's, so in other words. Shame and guilt don't always point to the truth. They point to how you feel about what you've done. And there's a distinction there, I think, that's important in the way we tell the story. So in the case of Lucia, Beckett feels shame, I guess, for uh, 
the impact he had on her that was negative. Um, but I, I don't, I mean, I think, you know, the shame and guilt are things that don't always exist the way that you think they do. In other words, other people may not feel the same way about those things that you do. So it's a kind of uniquely subjective and kind of slightly paralyzing state of mind that leads to kind of inertia to some extent. And you can see that in Beckett's work, I think, that's that sense of inertia. Um, so I hope that answers the question, which is quite a tricky one to answer. I think if you were saying specifically, you thought maybe that he had a heightened, exaggerated sense of guilt with Lucia than he should have done. And I think that's kind of the whole point of Beckett, that there was all this yeah. tragedy and guilt there and he wanted it all for himself, you know? That's just part of his makeup. But um, yeah, again, I think that was a brilliantly realized part of the film. Bueno, por razones de Due to a gender issues, it's a day which is complicated for all of the people who are here today. We have to finish the press conference here of Dance First right now. I want to thank all of you for being here, but there are also people in the front row. We've got some act the actresses and the DOP as well, so therefore a big round of applause for the film and congratulations for your film. <laughs>